so happy to have you all here today. Welcome to the American Colleges webcast, Unveiling Retirement Income Insights. My name is Lindsay Lewis. I am the director of our Center for Women here at the American College, and you are here for this partnered webcast with Financial Advisor Magazine. And we are talking about a very important topic today, Unveiling Retirement Income Insights, a Gender Perspective. I have the privilege of introducing Tracy Longo, who is our Washington editor, editor from Financial Advisor Magazine. She is a veteran writer. She has written four books, right? Four books? Right. Um, correct. Uh, she has a long history as a veteran writer in the space, and I'm going to turn the time over to Tracy. Oh, thank you so much, Lindsay. And for those of you who don't know it, Lindsay really is the ar architect of these webcasts, which continue to grow in popularity. There's more than 500 of you with us today. Thank you so much for joining. It's fantastic to see so many interested financial practitioners and executives tuning in for what really is a, a extraordinarily growing uh, topic in, in, in this space. So thank you for joining us at the American College Center for Women. Uh, this group is a powerhouse for must know research and programs. And it's a pleasure to have the two leading uh, forces with us on both those fronts today as we take a deeper dive into the vast opportunities that exist when it comes to re retirement planning for women. So uh, first we have Dr. Kaylee Rancic, uh, PhD and research director for the American College Center for Women in Financial Services. And she is the creator uh, of so all of the research and loves to dig into the data to champion women in financial services. Uh, she has 15 years of higher education and she's always looking for opportunities for women investors. I met her um, moderating a panel in New York City where she was also leading the way in research on getting more women into the C-suite, the corporate C-suite. So thank you so much for, for uh, joining us, Dr. Kaylee. And we also have Dr. Eric Lug Ludwig, who uh, is the program director at the American College. You lead the Center for Retirement Income, right, Eric? And Eric was Eric is an expert in retirement income planning. He's also an assistant, has been an assistant professor of retirement income and has 10 years as CEO and wealth manager at Stockbridge Private Wealth Management under his belt. He's also been a professor at both Kansas State and UCLA. So he'll he'll take this from the, the perspective of the practitioner. So Kaylee, let's start with you. You have been looking into this space for so long, and I know you have a ton of research and new research on the, in this area. Why don't you discuss with us the status of women and what your finding is changing and what practitioners and firms should be thinking about when, when trying to attract and really help women focus on their opportunities? That's great. Well, first of all, um, thank you, Tracy, for the very uh, kind introduction. Also, thank you to Eric and Lindsay for uh, joining us on this panel and both for um, Financial Advisor Magazine, as well as um, the American College for hosting this. Uh, to answer um, Tracy's question really around like what is changing in terms of women and the retirement income space and what we're seeing in terms of trends and data is that you know women themselves are not necessarily changing per se. Some of the actions that are happening, some of the social things that are, are impacting women's lives are certainly changing. But uh, women as a whole in terms of um, you know, desiring financial security and safety for themselves has not necessarily those values and those goals haven't really changed over the last several decades. What we have seen is that women are taking more responsibility and having to become more responsible for their financial security and well-being in retirement. And so um, really the catalyst of working in this space, and I am honored at the American College to work with several leading researchers who uh, research anything from the retirement income space, including Eric, but also, you know, some other really valued research colleagues. Um, they have uh, been working on the retirement income literacy survey, which is a survey that is, does come from the American College. And we've been conducting this survey for 
um, since 2014, and we have iterations uh, every three years where we are now comparing some of the data from you know, previous iterations. What we found in, uh, is that really there are differences between men and women, not only in whether or not they have the knowledge when it comes to financial um, security and retirement income literacy, but also kind of the values in which women see the role of financial advisors, the way that they feel confident in um, what it is that they know, uh, where they see uh, levels of importance and things that they want as part of their retirement income plan. And so I think it's important to note that women as a whole, both from our studies, but then also studies that are you know, external to the American college, and that is that women truly do value professional advice. And so I really wanna start there that the work that is being done with all of the individuals who are on this call is that women do value the expert advice and that's at a rate higher than men. And the other important piece is that women are wanting to and willing to refer their professional advisor to friends and family if they feel as though their goals are being met. So I just want to set like kind of the stage for why this is somewhat important. I think it's important, Tracy, and, and I don't want to overstep my bound, but I do want to set a little bit of a stage and a foundation to understand where women are in like as a whole. And what we're seeing is that women are obtaining both undergrad and graduate level degrees at a higher rate than men. But with that comes additional student loan debt that we see among women of all generations. Uh, having to burden in addition to planning for retirement or setting out uh, different types of uh, financial goals. And so that's a consideration for all generations. And it's certainly concerning when we're looking at Gen X and baby boomers who are averaging, you know, $23,000 in student loan debt. And so this is good, like a, a factor when it comes to planning for retirement and certainly income streams. Uh, the other thing is, is that we're seeing an increase in women controlling a large amount of wealth. So over the next uh, these seven to 10 years, we're gonna see women inherit approximately $30 trillion. Uh, this is happening mostly among the baby boomer generation in which we're seeing, um, you know, unfortunately a lot of women being widowed um, due to a spouse loss. And with that comes additional responsibility for that woman uh, to make sound, financial decisions in retirement. And what we know about uh, baby boomer generation is that women are less likely to be involved in the financial choices and decision-making when compared to women under the age of 45 who are partnered, married, cohabitating, um, in which they do make most of the financial decisions. Uh, so I think that those um, trajectories are really important in terms of uh, talking about some of the changes. And um, I'll just stop there. And if you want to you know, ask additional questions about that or more specifics in terms of um, retirement income. That's fantastic, Kaylee. And we'll, uh, we'll definitely circle back on that. Dr. Eric, um, I wanted to ask you how, you know, that sounds like very fertile ground for it for advisors and firms um, in terms of uh, some of the younger generations and really all generations of women needing financial advice. Where would you, and I know you and I have discussed this before, where would you start um, to begin to help and, and attract women, you know, to meet them where they are right now, re regardless of where that might be? Would you, you, you know, how would you have trained your advisors that you hired to, to work with women? We know, for instance, that, um, male advisors tend to make, you know, far less eye contact with women if, if both women and men are sitting there. So what kinds of things would you train advisors to do to really become more approachable and, you know, more um, able to work and, and establish trusting relationships with women clients? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. I mean, one of the things that we talked about previously is just from the timing aspect. And, you know, there was a question that you and I had discussed earlier, which was like from a timing perspective, when is the right time to start engaging in financial planning? And the earlier, the better, right? I mean, that 
to some extent, we know that there's um, discussions that can happen between family members. Like actually this morning, I had a discussion about uh, what QQQ is with my daughter. She asked me, what is that? And we were talking about different underlying holdings within an ETF. I'm like, that's pretty cool. She's eight years old. So obviously some of those conversations from a timing perspective can happen, you know, hopefully early, the earlier, the better. Um, so that's one aspect. The, the problem I think that happens with planners or just this is people in general, that the time that people start thinking about retirement is usually like a couple of years before retirement. And so that, that's a challenge, of course, between, you know, the amount of impact that, that a planner can have with that client. Um, in terms of, so the other part of the question was like, how would you engage with women, uh, maybe differently than men? And yeah, shoot, there's a, there's a lot there. I'm thinking, um, for one, you know, it seems like, and this is, these are generalizations, so, so take them as they are. But um, like, you don't want to maybe talk about statistics as as much maybe as some of these other uh, values and goals based thing. And I know Kaylee, you could talk about kind of what some of our survey says about this specifically. But the types of things that you're talking about in a meeting might be different um, with a predominantly you know sort of male driven conversation as a as compared to a female driven one. Very good. Thank you so much. Um... So I know I know that you have studied this um, for a long time, and uh, wanted to ask you how um, how you know we can address the fact that women know they have needs, Dr. Kaylee, but um, they may not know how to go about addressing it. And and so how do we wire advisors to know what some of these needs are? For instance. You know, how many women say they, they've tried to figure out how much money they'll need in retirement? Um, that's that's a fairly significant uh, number. And, you know, women need assistance with that. So that's such a basic sort of place to start when you when you want to get going on your financial plan is to know how much you're going to need. And because of longevity risk, et cetera, um, that's important. Could you talk about some of your findings around that and, and you know, how maybe advisors can, we'll turn to Dr. Eric for how maybe advisors can start addressing that longevity risk part. Right, no, I think that's a, a really important piece. So um, a couple of things I, I think uh, about women just in general is that when you're talking about retirement income, uh, what we found in, in, in terms of their knowledge base is that essentially all people fail like men and women. It is not just women who fail retirement income knowledge, um, asking questions about social security, asking questions about what does it mean, to, uh, long-term care, uh, how does Medicare work? What does it even cover? Uh, so there really is just a large knowledge gap to start. So there's, a, and for women in our study, we had uh, you know nearly 90% fail. Um, the questions, failure being that they answered 60% uh, or less. And so, um, but men honestly did not do much better. So there, it's not really an opportunity for just, uh, you know, helping women kind of move forward with their questions. But to uh, your point about where do they get started? Um, first, I think that there's, and Eric, I think you can maybe communicate about this, is there is a piece for women about confidence. And this is a, something that is a, a challenge. What our research found and also research that um, you know, has been conducted externally is that women do have a lack of confidence in certain types of financial decision-making. So what we know about women is they're fine in terms of their daily budgeting. They're good about making decisions. And, and Tracy, really, they do well when it comes to health insurance. Um, they're far more confident in understanding how to select a health insurance policy, um, whether or not uh, they want to purchase some type of insurance, life insurance, um, despite them not owning it, they, they understand the value. Where we see the lack of confidence is even selecting and hiring a um, financial advisor. And also, um, you know, that we see confidence issues around in investing and in investments. But um, one of the things I think that is 
really important here is back to something Eric said, and that's with women, is that's women in our study preferred over like the way that they valued a financial advisor, saw the value of a financial advisor was that they were goal oriented. They helped them meet their financial goals, walked them through even asking how much money I'm going to need in retirement. And then um, that was followed up by trust. Whereas men put uh, portfolio performance higher on valuation of their financial advisor. And so I think Eric, you can, can kind of talk about like maybe what that means in terms of working with female clients. And again, we're talking about generalizations, right? These are data points. I, I mean, you're gonna know your client better than you know a, a generalized data, but I think it's important to note that there are statistical differences between um, males and females. Thank you, Dr. Kaylee. So, so Dr. Eric, how would that um, desire, but in some instances, lack of confidence, could would you suggest that financial advisors, you know, bridge that gap? Uh, would you know what kind of offerings would be, you know, success more likely to be successful with women who might be hiring um, a financial advisor for the first time? Would you go about offering like salary negotiation, coaching, um, maybe compensation and employer benefit analysis and comparisons? Um, closing the gender gap types of discussions, career moves, um, taking time away from your career and what that might cost. How important would that kind of, you know, counseling be to try to reach, if it's your interest, younger women and get them started earlier on the path to having a, a plan that can get them, you know, to a comfortable retirement? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a, there's a couple of things, I guess, I'm thinking about there. One is, I think as a planner, you do, it is important to think about the type of client that you want to work with. And today we're, you know, hoping to kind of make a business case, at least for, for the potential of, you know, when, when Dr. Kelly had mentioned some of the uh, inherited amounts and, and future um, net worths of, of women clients specifically, I think there is a business case there as well. But I think part of it is like being true to the type of client that you want to work with. So, so that's part of it. So like if it's re in the retirement space, you know, be the specialist and, and help people with that aspect. Um, the other thing I was going to mention there is I think, you know, sometimes as planners, we know like all of the different ways that we could help any client, you know, despite gender, whatever. And so someone comes in the office and they have a question about, let's say it is employee benefits. And we have like 20 other issues that we know that they, that they have um, that we would like to help them with. And the concern there is that you overcomplicate something beyond what they just came in the office for, right? So I, I do think there is some importance of, of dealing with whatever issue number one, one is. Like if it's if it is something to do with, you know, salary negotiation, then absolutely be that resource for them or or point them to resources that that if if you don't have them. Um, the other thing is, is I think the use of a checklist, I think this is, again, despite gender, I think these are just some helpful things that like, Hey, look, today, we're going to help you with this particular issue. But then like simplifying some of these really complex financial things down to like, but here's like three action items that I would like you to take or think about. And I think sometimes simplifying things down to that, that level, again, despite, you know, regardless of gender, like those are some things that are are helpful just in general, I think. That's that's fantastic. Thank you so much. So I know that um, you and I, that all three of us really have talked about this in the past. Dr. Kaylee, um, talk about the gender pay gap, but especially how career breaks uh, and, you know, add to the income disparity and retirement balance disparity that women, um, you know, grapple with to a much greater extent than men do. How do, you know, what are some ways that that um, we should be thinking about this? What are you finding? Okay, so let's just talk about, uh, 
I think a lot of people are aware that there is a difference between the pay for men and women, that it is it is unequal. Um, we see that women on average make just shy of 84 cents on the on the one dollar one dollar of a man's earnings. And so over time, you see a pretty substantial decrease in the amount of money earned over the lifetime. So of course, as financial planners, the, there's just less there to work with. But there's also some other variables. One that you mentioned was stopping out of work. What we do see is that women over the course of their lifetime are less likely to have the same number of years within employment and certainly within full-time employment um, uh, when compared to their male counterparts. And over the course of that, um, I, you know, I don't, I apologize, this is a little outside of our research, so I don't have the numbers in front of me, but women do significantly have less money in their retirement accounts on average when compared to men at the age of 65. And it's a pretty substantial shortfall in terms of, you know, planning for retirement and then back to this longevity thing, the, the on average years that women will live um, when compared to men. And then of course, uh, the additional healthcare costs that women often um, accrue over the course of their retired life lifespan. And so those are things to certainly, you know, consider. Um, I think when we also talk about um, women who are outside of the, the workforce is that there's also debt. And when we look at women compared to men, I just said that like likely they earn less, they stop out of work um, over time, so have less years of earning potential. Um, then there's also an increased amount of debt. Women hold most of all debt. Uh, they hold more than men in all areas with the exception of a home equity line of credit. So when you're looking at some of the challenges that women face, and, and several of these women who are fit this exact um, demographic are still individuals who could benefit from a financial planner, but it really is about strategizing around those um, reductions in overall income. And one thing that we don't generally talk about, and I don't know if a financial planner can really help with this, but I think you know, often we see women stepping out of the workplace to care give, whether that's for um, children or aging family members or another family member, is often there's a comparison of income. So it's, you make more than I do, I'll stay out of the workforce and care for um, wh whomever needs, needs the caring. And often what isn't sometimes accounted for is the reduction in income due to lack of promotion opportunities throughout the course of um, the employment lifespan. And that's due to those breaks in, in employment. And so there's even kind of a, an additional, lack of a better term, a tax on stepping out. It's not just the lost income for those, um, those years and those credits towards social security. Uh, so I think uh, Eric can really kind of maybe speak to what kinds of techniques and tools as a provider, as a planner um, for, for women who are facing the shortfall. And so Dr. Eric, how do advisors and how did you as an advisor and a wealth manager address with uh, women clients the fact that there is a significant cost uh, attached to uh, taking these these gaps in employment um, for you know for very good reasons for for you know whatever reason that they choose we know that that women tend to earn a significant amount less and also social security when they take it at age sixty five or sixty seven um, the average benefit is significantly less and you know just over dinner dinner conversations. I see that it's an aha moment with so many women when they realize, you know, maybe their mom or why their aunt or someone only is getting, you know, credit for 15 years of, of uh, you know, work, work uh, it, when they calculate their social security. So just some of those basics, how can advisors 
um, you know, I come from the school of tough love. So that's why I'm a journalist and not an advisor, because I would be like, you can't do that. <laughs> and that's really not the right approach. So what approach do you, would you suggest is meaningful to use with clients who are going to make value-based decisions based on, you know, where, where their values align, but you do want them to understand there's a cost and it can become significant when you're making those kinds of decisions. Yeah, boy, such a such a big topic there. I think in general, I mean, we see this not only with like child rearing or, or whatever you want to call it, leaving the workplace, but in general, I mean, there's kind of an issue, if you will, with women sort of being the default for facing, you know, like being prioritizing sort of family needs over saving. So earlier in the career, yeah, it's this child rearing or whatever you want to call it uh, aspect which is difficult. I mean, it's for sure, it's for sure a trade-off and, and, you know, we can talk about the dollars and cents aspect of it, but there is like more to life than, than the financial aspect. And it, it is being aware of what those are. And, and I think for one, it's like being sensitive to that as a planner is like, is like starting those conversations with saying things like, Hey, look, you know, we can sort of run the numbers on this and you know, ultimately it is their decision to decide what's best for them and their, and I, I think even like having those types of conversation starters makes it much more palatable, whatever their decision is. Like, cause the one thing like our, our research showed was things around shame. Like you would never want to sort of like frame this as like, this is a wrong decision and this is the negative impact that's going to come as a result of that. But to say like, Hey, look, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Uh, throughout one's life. And this is certainly one of them and, and at least being aware of it. And I think that's the main thing is like, like, Hey, look, ultimately this is going to come down to what's important for you, but let's at least look at this financially because there are probably other opportunities. Like I know that you had mentioned that last time, Tracy is like, like thinking like, okay, let's just say this is not a binary decision, like either to work or to stay at home. Right. The benefit if there is one of COVID was that we have like this work for home, like I'm at my house, like we're all, I think at, at our home locations, right? So some of those opportunities um, happen where you maybe don't need to just completely punch out of the workforce. The other is is thinking about ways to be creative around uh, part-time income. So that that's an aspect. Um, and then, you know, this the same kind of conversation happens later too, where um, even if the, you know, sort of they go into school and they're trying to re-answer the workforce. Then later we have this idea around elder care responsibilities, which is maybe its own subject, but um, but I, I do think it is important to to like say like, hey, look, it's not for me to decide, but let's at least do the math on this. And then you get, you can have at least a more educated decision when, you know, whatever you decide is best for you. Yeah, that. That is, you know, an educated consumer is is really, you know, the best consumer. And I do think um, just from seeing the aha look on some folks' faces when you discuss this, as I'm sure both of you have seen and, and all the folks in our audience today, um, realizing, you know, if you take 15 or five or 10 or one or two years off, what that is going to cost is, you know, could be life-changing and, and might encourage people, as you said, to make different decisions and you know it's not black and white so understanding maybe working from home a few days a week or keeping your foot in the door for career advancement can be very important so as we look at longevity risk um women on average live three years longer than men and so what are some of the topics around here that advisors should be mindful of in terms of making sure women have those assets um, you know, in addition to, you know, what men also need. So um, what kinds of tools, what kind of products might um, advisors start looking at, especially in this hyperinflationary environment? Kaylee, I'll let you, you know, you talk about the, you know, what you're seeing from your research perspective. 
Actually, you bring up a really great topic, and I, I am actually kind of glad you brought up inflation. I, I think that that's one of the factors, and I think, Eric, as, as a provider, you, you can communicate a little bit about what this looks like. Um, this is particularly important for women, inflation, and, and I say that because often, um, and we really have only barely touched on widowhood, uh, and really what that means in terms of a provider, but, you know, a, a planner and, and that support system, but also the fact that women, um, widows, 70% of them select a different uh, planner after, you know, their spouse passes. So there's there's some things we we can do, I think, as, as planners, if we want to keep that business, you know, in-house. But in terms of what we're seeing uh, about, um what women are looking for is that women in general, uh, and, and in our study, uh, we saw that over 60% of the women really value life insurance. And for certain um, subgroups of women and different racial backgrounds and demographics, um, they value life insurance a little bit different and are more likely to own life insurance. And for some, life insurance serves as a, a way to um, pass on some level of inheritance to their families. And uh, that is an important part for women. And I think I just a little caveat, totally unrelated to this longevity issue, is that women often are um, considered more philanthropic in terms of some of their planning wishes. Um, and so life insurance and insurance in general, and in as a whole has been a part of, uh, you know, we see an increase in women really wanting that as part of of their plan, both for um, inheritance issues, also philanthropic um, giving options. But then I think there's also, um, especially over the last few years, is that we're seeing um, a change with, with women in desiring different uh, forms of, um, quote unquote, like vehicles that allow for some level of guaranteed income. Um, and so that is showing up not only in our previous studies, but um, in a preliminary um, review of the data for our most recent iteration. And I just want to put out a, a little push here that we are going to drop those um, final results for the most recent iteration, which will look at everything kind of post COVID um, in early 2024. But we are seeing that that the inflation is impacting the way that I would say everyone, but women in particular, in terms of um, desiring uh, vehicles that allow allow them to protect against not only inflation, but also longevity risk. Thank you, Dr. Kaylee. So um, Dr. Eric, that, you know, how do you help women clients or clients you, you can look, you know, talk to and based on a variety of factors, suggest they're going to have greater longevity. How do you help them plan? I see that um, even fee-only advisors have started to really be driven by client demand to look at annuity products, guaranteed income stream, as Dr. Kaylee was talking about. Um, how do you know? What is your take on that? And you know, how would you suggest advisors and planners? start helping clients understand. And we also know that, um, you know, our, defi our defined um, benefit plans have, have kind of gone by the wayside in most careers. So we have to, you know, we, we have to make up for any shortfall. So, um, and I think also in looking at Morningstar research, we know that that guaranteed income piece can really solve um, a number of these different pieces. Not the, not the whole piece, but certainly a piece of it. How do you look at, uh, you know, annuities and guaranteed income, creating guaranteed income streams in, in retirement plans, especially for women? Yeah, I mean, it's such an important question because like the problem that we were mentioning is that, so like say the average woman does live longer than the average male, right? So, so think of this, there's this compounding issue though, that like, okay, so in general, they're being paid less. They may be leaving the workforce either early and then doing it again later, like sort of pre-retirement. So there's this compounding issue. And then they, you know, that's probably why like the net effect of that is that there's lower uh, retirement balances available. So then we're stuck with this issue of like, well, shoot, now what do we do about it? The interesting, I was kind of laughing to myself when Dr. Kelly was mentioning uh, about insurance, because the joke is that like, 
nobody really walks into the office and says like, hey, I want to buy some life insurance. But, but what their survey is finding is that people are actually interested in annuities or maybe if you, there's some you know negative connotation with the word annuity, but talking about these guaranteed streams of lifetime income. The interesting thing too is that there's like when Secure 2.0 got passed, there was differences in the, so you're right, there's like a lower amount of defined benefit uh, plan options as compared to years past. But with Secure 2.0 passing, one of the things that got in there was the amount that you can use for annuitized wealth within a deferred uh, a DC plan. So that's really cool. So not only is it more available, but we're also seeing demand for it. So that's like sort of the easy way. It's funny too, because historically people come into the office and I'm sure all the planners that are on here know they're going to shake their head and go, yep, yep. You have people that come in and say, I don't need that. I'll just buy dividend paying stocks. And for 15 years, the, the yield on the S&P is like 2% and you couldn't really get yield from, from stocks. Now, yeah, maybe with inflation, maybe that'll change a little bit. But um, so that was one aspect I wanted to mention. The other thing I think that's related to that is around social security planning, because some of these are from a product perspective. Yes, we have to select them and so on. But so Social Security, essentially, you know, we will get a benefit. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity from a planning perspective that, that you can create value uh, with your clients. I met with someone not that long ago that these people, um, very high net worth clients, they thought that it was in their best interest to take Social Security at 62 because they thought, oh, shoot, I can, I can, um, invest it and, and try to earn an additional rate of return on it. Well, it, the, the male um, passed away at 72. And despite them each having high incomes throughout their life, the, the wife's benefit is like $1,600 a month. Well, for them, yes, they have the assets and they're fine. Like it's not an issue, but it's like things around that. It's like, geez, how much money are they leaving on the table just by some sort of simple decisions that could have been made. So I, I think there's another planning opportunity there. And that's fascinating. And it's things, I mean, we're, we're starting to think about that and really drill down into that a lot more now. And I know the advisor industry does in the planning industry, but yeah, the general population, I mean, I think all of these are major uh, draws for women wanting to do, you know, start doing financial planning for their retirement. So thank you for bringing that up. One thing many of you may not know is that Kaylee uh, is Dr. Kaylee. It is it also a columnist for Financial Advisor Magazine, and she did a fascinating article for us um, on um, how women think about healthcare. One finding is that you know because women live longer, they need twenty one thousand dollars more to cover healthcare expenses when they enter retirement. So they need one hundred ninety three thousand you know, dollars. And they're more, they're more open to that and more amenable to that than, than men are when they, you know, think about planning for their retirement, but unfortunately they still do have that shortfall. So, um, and, 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 and they have not really covered only 8% of them have covered, um, you know, themselves in terms of purchasing long-term care insurance, even though we know that 70% of the population will, will need it. So, Kaylee, what are some of your thoughts on how advisors and, you know, and women themselves can start doing financial planning around this healthcare need that's going to be gaping for, for so many of us, in, at, you know, as we move through retirement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I appreciate the call out on the column, but uh, that actually references uh, the Retirement Income Literacy Survey. And really, it's just an acknowledgement that so often when we talk about retirement, we talk about retirement income, we really do talk about, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to go see the grandkids, we're going to travel, we're going to downsize, we're going to do all the things we put aside to work and develop this, this ass, these assets to enjoy during um, our golden years. And then really what we're finding is that for for many, they haven't saved really enough. It puts them in certainly a position at end of life where they um, are in need of serious, um, you know, consistent healthcare needs. 
and are facing like the spend down issues to be able to be eligible for um, services because they don't actually have the resources to pay for health care costs. And what we found was that that was one of the number one things that women in particular are most concerned about, which would make sense because it parallels their confidence levels in terms of what they're confident in, which would include, you know, health care, uh, health insurance choices. And then also, um, I think that it's important to note that I think for planners, sometimes having those real conversations, and Eric, I think you can kind of talk about this, like what you talk about with your clients, um, and that is the fact that so often we're not talking about those last few years of life where, I mean, caregiving is real, that the travel is probably not happening, that you're going to not be living on a certain percentage of your income because healthcare costs certainly are much more substantial than, you know, your mortgage or for many retirees, just their property tax and, and home maintenance or condo maintenance. But the fact that the healthcare costs are so much higher. So having real conversations about true longevity uh, health histories, um, real issues around like how is your health, like what kinds of expectations have you communicated with your family as to if you are in need of caring, if you are in need of care, is someone going to take care of you? Understanding that really people didn't even know whether or not Medicare or Medicaid paid for long-term care. So there's a disconnect in terms of knowledge as to what's provided. And so having those real conversations that are not as pretty, it's not about developing income. It's not about, you know, the trips to see the grandkids, but, you know, kind of the nitty gritty of, of what happens, you know, that none of us can escape. And that's, you know, end of life, end of life care. I mean, Eric, you were just, you know, communicating about losing one of your clients at a very young age. I, I'm certainly probably wasn't expecting that. So if you want to kind of talk about what what that means for you as a provider. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's two big planning opportunities. Um, one is the health savings accounts. I mean, I think these are like, like people don't really, you know, don't know what they are. And it's like, geez, it's like, I always explain it like when I'm teaching about HSA, it's like a, it's like a Roth, but like you also get a tax deduction, right? Like it's, you know, so anyways, there's a planning opportunity and an education piece around HSAs. I mean, because, yeah, so let's say that women face higher higher healthcare costs, let's say throughout retirement, maybe, um, which can lead to that, you know, later, like financial strain later in life. So how do you offset that? Well, one is to sort of plan for it. And then one is like, how do you do that in the most tax efficient manner? So that's where like just educating clients again on use of HSA, health savings accounts, you know, how do they work? Um, you know, the ideas are on portability after leaving your employer, like things like that, I think are a, an awesome opportunity. The other is long-term care insurance. And I think, you know, this, you know, maybe I'll ruffle some feathers and with advisors on here, but for sure, uh, clients default response is going to be, that's too expensive for me. Right. So again, there's like so many other products and that's not the purpose of the webcast, but is again, like, like, hey, like there's asset-based long-term care and there's other ways that we can do the planning aspects for maybe things that they already own. Um, and again, going back to you, Dr. Keith, I think what was interesting from the survey is like people are actually, or women in particular, are more open to these things and they're more knowledgeable about it. So it's like, cool, you're already starting with a certain knowledge base and there's like an opportunity to expand upon that. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Um, so if anyone in the audience has questions, please drop them in the chat. We'll definitely get to a few of them. Um, on the healthcare planning front, um, is there anything in particular that you think women should be doing, Dr. Kaylee, that they're not right now um, in, in terms of education that per, you know firms and employers and advisors can help women think through? Um, that they may not, you know, based on some of the stuff, Dr. Eric, you know, health savings accounts, all of that. Are you seeing, I know that you cover the Employee Benefits Research Institute and, uh, and you know, other, uh, other, you know, fonts of what's going on in that arena. Do you think uh, employers could do more to educate or 
financial firms could do more to drive the health savings accounts and other options, you know, to their employees to get them started at a younger age? I personally think this is a great question. And I think for all the people in the audience, especially if you have institutional clients, the reason that this is really important is what um, a study that came out that used uh, CPS data. So this is like nationally represented re representative data that came out. And uh, I think it was T. Rowe Price. What they found was that um, women and men, there was no gender gap in access to like 401ks. And so they were eligible to use these resources at the same level, uh, starting out at their employees. What they found is that women use them less often than men, mostly like 401k participation. But the reason I bring this up is because so often there's like a plan advisor or an option through some kind of employee benefit. Um, and one of the things that they see is that women significantly less, which means statistically speaking, when you're looking at men and women, men are more likely to utilize a plan advisor or someone that's offered through an employee benefit um, institution to get information on HSAs, to get information on the benefits that they have, or to you know put their retirement in certain places. And to really give that advice, women are way less likely to take advantage of that. And so this is a great opportunity, I think, in terms of starting earlier about some of the benefits, both on the healthcare front, but certainly on um, the retirement uh, you know, accumulation side, is to encourage women because it is so much, it's, it's substantially less in terms of not only just contribution, but also utilizing an advisor or an expert at these institutional um, locations to get employer uh, uh, plan providers or advisors. And that includes both from the healthcare side. So I do think that it's a really unique opportunity uh, to start younger. Um, I would probably also say, you know, with Eric, it's certainly if you, access to an HSA. Um, and also uh, what I do think in terms of the research, uh, not our research, but research that was conducted by the um, Longevity Center, I think it's called, it was the TIA Institute and um, Anna Maria Lusardi, who is a kind of an expert in financial literacy, um, uh, center really found that women, this is really great, but women actually have a really, um, they have a much better uh, understanding of their longevity and ex like they can um, estimate their longevity at a, a, a more accurate rate when compared to men. And so I think that there's some natural things that you know, both providers and certainly um, employers and um, benefit providers um, can lean into. Oh, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I know that I've calculated my, based on, you know, just sort of benchmarks that I've used from the insurance and other industries, calculated my own, uh, you know, longevity. So that's interesting that a lot of women are doing that. Thank you for sharing that. And um, Dr. Eric, we actually have a question that's, you know, dovetails into this. Does it make sense to contribute to a health savings account if a client is not already maxing out on their 401k plan? Yeah, right, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting question. Keep in mind, you, you have to meet the requirements. So like, the, so you have to be in a high deductible health insurance plan to qualify to contribute to an HSA. So there's that aspect of it first. Um, but yeah, I mean, keep in mind, you are getting a tax deduction. So it's not like it's a complete trade-off of like maximizing say after-tax cash flow. I think the other planning opportunity there is if you have healthy, high income earners, they're always looking for ways to get tax deductions and, and tax sensitive planning. So like to the extent that you can help with their tax bill and like the idea that, hey, look, this, you know, there is a future use for this, whether it's health related or, or otherwise. So I don't know if that directly answers it. I mean, I don't know that I'd be so worried about maxing out the 401k plan. And, and using this because the other part of that would be 
you know, are you going to use the health insurance services? And like, part of that is like, are you going to use it now? But like, are you going to use it later? Because it, it doesn't just go poof, like a, like a flexible spending account. So yeah, I think it still makes sense. I mean, you know, client dependent, but yeah, it's, it's definitely worth having a conversation about it. Okay. Thank you. And we have an interesting question uh, from an attendee who said access to institutional plans and info is great, but it doesn't mean that info is really presented in the way that's most meaningful to women. So who like uh, goal-based overviews, not just statistics. So how do you, you know, how do you think is the most effective way to communicate some of these issues to women? Dr. Kaylee, what do you think? Uh, I think that's actually a really great point. And I appreciate whoever posted that question because I just read that and was like, we do need to touch base on that. Um, I was using the stats more or less as a way to understand that there is an opportunity there, like kind of an unmet need. But to your point, communication is key and it certainly is key um, among any demographic, but certainly for women. And what we know about how women kind of interact um, or uh, consume information and where they feel comfortable and confident. And I think Eric actually might want to talk a little bit about this because we had this conversation earlier. So women get their information from um, friends and family mostly and a level of like how that, how, I mean, how the information is disseminated. And certainly um, in that knowing that, I think that it's important to know that there has to be a level of trust. And so to your point about communication, it can't just kind of come out in like some, you know, trifold that says, you know, here, take advantage of this resource. So there has to be a level of that information go through some form of trust, whether it's through an employee resource, resource group. If there is a way to increase that level of attraction when it comes to a reason why that person would want to be reading it or getting that information. So trust is a factor. I think to tying it to values is super important um, because of how we know that like women um, tend to put more effort and interest into things that they align with their values. So when we're talking about um, you know, health and what that means long-term, I think tying it to a value system is really important. I also think similarly to um, uh, the value and also you know, making it kind of small and, and uh, in a community of, of trust. But Eric, we were talking about this a little earlier, like how do you communicate really specific content to women? So I don't know if you wanna take it from here. Yeah. It, you know, to me, it reminds me of the, like the fairness and credit conversations of like, here you go. I mean, we gave you the information on your mortgage. What do you mean you don't understand it? Right? Like, obviously that didn't work out well. <laughs> it's kind of similar issue with um, insurance benefits. And, uh, you know, one way that, I mean, there's probably an opportunity at the plan level to think about ways of sharing information using visuals. Again, like sort of regardless of gender, I mean, maybe males are more likely to want to look at tables, but I I would guess, regardless of gender, that in general, there's an opportunity for plans to uh, present information with, you know, um, expected costs, you know, but also benefits in the form of, of visuals. And maybe that's looking at it more than just one year or two or so. Um, and if the plan can't do it, then that's where you as a planner could, you know, get, get your hands dirty with Excel and find creative ways to, to share that information. We got this question a few different times from the audience, how do you address the issue of reluctance on the part of females and other uh, other clients to hire a financial advisor if the family earns less than a hundred thousand? Yeah, shoot, yeah, that's difficult. I mean, I think the the really interesting thing that I think has changed throughout time is that there's planning that's starting to be offered. Uh, despite like sort of like, let's just start with this. Like, so there's the old sort of commission-based way, right? And then we saw this huge trans transition to asset-based. Well, now we see more fee for planning opportunities. So um, I think there's just more opportunities there that you could do, it's kind of like how we started the conversation. There's some more specific planning type of opportunities that you could create or, or provide rather um, for individuals earlier in the process that don't have to be 
you know, exorbitant fees. You don't probably need a $15,000 retirement plan. You need something that just kind of gets you started. So I think that's how I would address that. There's, there's planners out there that I think that can help. And, it, you know, it's up to them how much they charge. And it's also up to the consumer to, to search for who offers those types of services. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaylee and Dr. Eric. I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay. Thank you so much for this informative webcast. But also, if you're interested in this topic, we do have our Retirement Income Certified Professional designation. You can use the screen, scan the QR code, and learn more about that designation. You can follow our panelist on LinkedIn. You can find Kaylee Rank there. And between the time we made this slide, you know, Eric defended his dissertation and became Dr. Eric. So find him on LinkedIn. You can also find Tracy there as well. Again, a special thank you to Financial Advisor Magazine for being our media partner for this very important topic. And we look forward to having you at a future webcast. Thank you so much.